Can you all hear me well enough? Good evening. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Vernon Hyde Minor to close our 2014-2015 lecture series. Uh, to repeat a line I used two years ago in introducing his wife, the architectural historian Heather Hyde Minor, there's nothing minor about Vernon's CV, um, but I will give you the short version. Just a brief outline of his academic and professional experience. Um, he was a tenured professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder from 1976 until 2006 in the departments of art and art history and comparative literature and humanities. And I think some of that interdisciplinary dimension will be an aspect of his talk. He was, where, while he was there, he was director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies uh, from 1985 to 86. He was chair of the Department of Humanities uh, from 93 to 94 chair of the Department of Fine Arts from 94 to 96. And since 2006, he's been a research professor, research scholar at the School of Art and Design at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He was the director of a National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Seminar, Art, History, and Culture in Rome, 1527 to 1798, at the American Academy in Rome in the summer of 2011. And he was the James S. Ackerman Scholar in Residence at the American Academy from September 2011 to January 2012. A brief list of his books, especially the most recent ones, include the In Progress, the Narrative of Baroque Sculpture, again, the theme about which we'll be hearing uh, tonight, which is um, in progress, as I said. There is a forthcoming book called Baroque Visual Rhetoric, which will be coming out from the University of Toronto Press in 2015 this year. Um, his book, The Death of the Baroque and the Rhetoric of Good Taste, was published by Cambridge in 2006. And his book, Baroque and Rococo, Art and Culture, uh, came out in 1999 from Henry Ab Harry Abrams in New York. Uh, he was also the editor of volumes 49 through 55 of the Memoirs of the American Academy in Rome, which is a collection of scholarly essays uh, organized mostly around Academy Fellows' work. Uh, a, a lot of articles and chapters um, that I will refrain from citing, but I will end with saying that his fellowships and grants include two associated with Rome. He was a visiting fellow at the Bibliotheca Herziana in Rome from February through May of 2001, and he was National Endowment for the Humanities Senior Rome Prize Fellow at the American Academy in 1999 and 2000. So, all of those accomplishments aside, some of you might be wondering why we would close our School of Architecture lecture series with an historian talking about Baroque sculpture in Rome. Well, hopefully anything that involves Rome needs no justification for this crowd. But for those of us who love Rome, like Vernon, his wife Heather, and I do, to love Rome is to love the Baroque. Rome is, more than anything else, a city of the Baroque. And it is one of the essential characteristics of Rome in the Baroque that the arts became integrated, indeed inextricable. In fact, this was one of the primary critiques of the Baroque by the neoclassicists, who thought that the arts should not be inextricable. So if to love Rome is to love the Baroque, and to love the Baroque is to love the integration of the arts, for us architects, it's essential that we learn from historians exactly how what the Beaux-Arts called the Allied Arts became integrated with architecture. So much so that the Roman Academy di San Luca's motto for its Academy of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture was equa potestas, equal power. And they became integrated precisely for the reason articulated in Vernon's title, narrative. If the neoclassicists abandoned the integration of the arts, they also abandoned narrative in architectural space. Some of us are now trying to recover it. It's my great pleasure, therefore, to give you Vernon Heinmeier and San Agnese in Piazza Novo. OK, is my mic on? Can you hear me? Okay. Well, I think we might, we might be overhearing you. Okay. Uh, if it gets, no, that sounds, that sounds okay to me if it's not a problem for you. Thank you, David. I, the, I, I wish I had my pen. I was gonna take notes on what you were saying there about <laughs> of the Baroque. Not about me, but about the Baroque. I mean, it was very good. Uh, and when you mentioned something about the various positions I had at the University of uh, Colorado, I forgot all about them. I said, hey, that's right, I did. <laughs> that, was part, that came up from an old Vita, in other words, that sort of stuff. So thank you so much. That was so kind on your birthday for you to say such nice things to me. But, uh, happy birthday. We come into the church of San Agnese from the, yeah, we can see this pretty well here, 
From the frenetic buzz of Rome's Piazza Navona, where the splashing of Bernini's four rivers fountain, the murmurs of swarming crowds, the barking voices of hucksters and purveyors of trinkets, the importunings of portrait painters sustain the steady thrumming of an energetic, everyday, if somewhat theatrical life. Of course, I describe Piazza Navona as it is today. In the mid-17th century, just before the erection of Bernini's Four Rivers Fountain, it was a market with shouting merchants and vendors of plenty, not to mention flamethrowers and street performers. And it was the location of the occasional jostra, or joust, as, as we see here in uh, Andrea Saki's painting. Pope Innocent X, who reigned from 1644 to 55 and was of the Banfili family, in effect changed the zoning laws, here he is in the famous portrait, changed the zoning laws, pushing most of the crowds in Piazza Navona, which was his home piazza, uh, where he was born, actually, into other neighborhoods while inviting in his family's, um, uh, into his family's piazza, quite literally the carriage trade. <coughs> the city's most expensive and glittering carriages were not only allowed to pass through the piazza, they were invited to promenade, circling at their leisure. The ambient noise must have lessened considerably, with shouting voices replaced by horses' hoofs and metal trimmed wheels clattering and clicking about, creating racket enough one imagines, but in more of a stately clamor than a rude uproar. Today, as one did centuries ago, we enter into the quieter and darker spaces of innocent Sant'Agnese, with its fairly broad windows set into the base of the dome, admitting generous pools of light on a sunny day. When it was overcast, the sense of light and atmosphere inside the church remains dim. It looks particularly dim here, but you can get a sense of it. It can be that dim, in fact, and sepulchral. Leaving behind Piazza Navona for the embrace of San Agnese's sacred space, which soars upward to the dome and circles around an octagon built into a Greek cross, and you architects will be able to spot immediately the octagon built into the Greek cross from this plan. We also wing to another level of reality, a new universe of experience and meanings. The church excludes the world outside while instantiating in both Neoplatonic and Christian terms the ethereal, the heavenly, and the anagogic. The experience can be quite literally awesome. One commentator, a man by the name of Michael Hyde, tells us something about the hermeneutics of awe, and I quote, in a moment of awe, one's relationship to the world is that of respecting beings by letting them be what they are. The moment is holy, for now the manner in which one experiences the presence of things is most like the saying that first acknowledged life and called it into being, and God said, let there be light. End quotation. The awe, which is part of wonder and therefore baroque meraviglia, the marvelous, creates astonishment and respect. There is a moral element to knowing something in the manner of awe. What I describe is prayer, which is not unlike meditation, even in a certain sense sleep. A worshipful experience of entering Santa Agnese is, to a certain degree, dreamlike. Not everyone in the later 17th century entered Santa Agnese from out of doors, because this is the uh, the Palazzo Pamphili, which is right next door, and there we get to the church, because this was a private church for the Pamphili family, whose palace is next door. By the way, you can lean out of the palace and look over the window of the palace and look right into the uh, facade of San Agnese. We can also imagine the worshiper arriving from within. She or he would have come directly from the palace through the doorways and stairs past the backside of the corretto screens, which you see here is a corretto screen. So um, this is a colleague of, of ours who's uh, looking down. So one could have coming from the Pamphili Palace uh, could look down into the church itself and not be seen, but participate or at least observe the worship. Before arriving at the various altars beneath grand sculptural reliefs. But I interrupt here my narrative and my consideration of the narratives inside San Agnese 
so that I can begin with an apologia, a defense or at least an explanation of my opinions and my approach, which are not all that typical of traditional art historical discourse, although they're not that atypical either, but I thought I should, that I, I, I feel that I have the need to say at the beginning that in this talk I am being critical, theoretical, interpretive, and narratological. Although I will be providing fairly traditional kinds of information, this I think is probably not a conventional art history lecture, or architectural history lecture for that matter. We will see just the same that the kinds of critical theory I'll be using depend upon historical evidence. And I also believe that the knowledge we acquire when applying critical theory to works of art depends upon the understanding we already have. Knowledge that suggests to us what it is we're already doing when we walk about a church and look at the architecture and the so-called furnishings. We both experience and understand that Sananyesi is a Gesamtkunstwerk, a total work of art. That's a 19th century German phrase, but it describes, it was, it was made to describe the Baroque, the total work of art. In this building, the sculpture is the architecture and vice versa. The architecture has a narrative, one unfolding with those stories represented in the high marble reliefs, marble reliefs set into pendented, which you see one here. The painting, sculpture, and architecture, even the organ and its music were planned and executed as a whole, a total work of art. That's not the original organ. I think this is the fourth organ they had. But I've gone to the Port Pamphili archives, and I've seen that there was an organ there from the very beginning. Music was an important part of this total experience of being in San Agnese. There's more to it than that, too, as we'll see. Innocent X <clears throat> ordered as an act of jus patronatus that the Vatican's vicariato, which is the office of his vicar general, cede authority of the church to his family. Normally, such an act referred to a chapel, such as this one, the Sistine Chapel, and the Borghese Chapel in Rome, Santa Maria Maggiore, different Sistine Chapel than the one in the Vatican, of course, not to an entire ecclesiastical building. To a significant, significant extent then, these images of violence, which you're going to see, and martyrdom speak first of all to the Pamphili family and only afterward to outside visitors. By the way, the church finally returned to um, the Vicariato in the 1990s. Not until then. It was a family church until then. Interpretation. Interpretation begins the moment we look at a work of art, the second we step into San Agnese. The question, what does it mean, is both profound and pretentious. The profundity comes from the very roots of the word profound, which is Anglo-Norman in origin, and it has to do with looking far, wide, and deep. Although this kind of looking is what critical historians of art try to do, one just the same risks being swallowed by the very task of interpretation, which is never ending in everywhere, especially in this church apparent. There too is something pretentious and presumptuous about interpretation because hiding in the background of such an activity is the hope and supposition that we can understand fully what it is we seek, that we can, in a sense, nail it, get it right. But of course, we know better. We realize that interpretation coexists with humility. One's answers or responses are always, and by necessity, tentative and incomplete. To query is not just to question, but to complain, to become with a certain knitting of the brow querulous, maybe even petulant. Interpreting, questioning, and reading bedevil us because to interpret and attempt to comprehend arise from our desire to see who we are in light of what we hope to understand. We always find ourselves caught up in webs of narrative, of narrative stories whose telling never seems to end. Although one strives for comprehension of the so-called horizons of experience faced by artists and patrons in the past, our own horizons and assumption, assumptions shape our theories and critical methods. We need to pay attention to that. Art objects bring with them, as Georges Didi Ubermann has taught us, an interesting French art historian, no guarantee of their interpretation. They can be elusive. There is a sweet sadness to our work, even when confronting the thing in itself, as here with my study of San Agnese and Adone, these tombs, this church, its grand spaces, paintings, and high reliefs, all of it enduring and existing 
in the same place and nearly the same condition as it did in 17th, Ro in 17th century Rome. It, the thing, each of these monuments to the Roman church and the Roman martyrs, which are going to be seen quite a few of, is not what it was, nor is the church itself what it was. These giant marble reliefs do not mean as they once did. We do not understand them in quite the same way as they were understood, though I have to wonder by whom exactly, when put into place. As the philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer tells us, quote, we understand in a different way if we understand at all. We're talking about the past. But there is the satisfaction of knowing that the work of art, again, in the present instance, this church and these monumental high reliefs, one of which I'm singling out, for tonight's lecture, not that one, though. Leaves room for us to read them, to enter into their interpretation. Everyone who construes and infers mistakes a claim to that which he or she confronts. The high reliefs are not just sculptural forms. They are not just entities, but events and stories. We resist closure. We can never say, as I suggested earlier, that we have nailed it, rendered the final meaning, one leaving no room for further critical response. Events continue. Stories stay with us throughout our lives. And finally, with regard to my critical approach, I should confess how old-fashioned I am. I believe in and try to practice close reading, a critical posture associated with the so-called new critics who thrived in the early to middle decades of the past century. Literary critics. <coughs> Anthony Grafton, everybody's favorite, favorite professor, I think, has told us in his recent Mellon lectures that there was in the 17th century, especially in Rome, a fascination, perhaps even an obsession, with martyrdom, persecution, and the suffering of the early Christians, the kind of violence to which the Church of San Agnese gives voice as well as image and to which it is dedicated. Here we relive narratives of martyrdom. Emma Rentiana is about to be stoned to death. Cecilia is breathing her last after being nearly decapitated. Flames engulf a kneeling and prayerful Agnes. Although riven with arrows, St. Sebastian will live to die another day. The Church of San Agnese, awash with such brutality and suffering, overwhelms us with its images of pain while at the same time reassuring us through its physical structures and persistence in time that martyrdom bodes well. Perhaps we can sense from the coherence and balance of Francesco Borromini's and Carlo Rinaldi's architecture, its generous natural lighting and its exquisitely carved, utterly integrated, monumental reliefs made from the finest marble Carrara could produce, that stories of martyrdom augur glory. Grafton says in his lecture that, quote, ancient martyrdom resonated with both the devout and the radical at a time that is the 17th century. I thought I'd show you a few flames while talking about um, Tony is quoting from him. When the theater of violence created by the first ideological wars in Europe made martyrdom a, not a distant, but a living experience, melding past, present, and future, end quotation. The theater to which Grafton refers needs its narrative. We art historians need our narratology. The narrativity in San Agnese encompasses both architecture and sculpture. The reliefs hammer their points home. The architecture works as the space of narrative. Here we see that the Roman martyrs obviously have an afterlife in the survival of the Holy Catholic Church, which is, after all, the society founded by the Lord Jesus Christ and defined and documented by the writers of the New Testament. Innocent X's celebration of early Roman martyrs, their deaths and their dying, fits into a powerful Tridentine theme confirms and endorses himself as a pope whose origins are Roman, and right there in the piazza. Innocent directed the church not just during his papacy, but saw to it, the architecture and sculpture resonating with this affirmation, that the Holy Catholic Church would survive, endure, and flourish forever. Georges Didi Ubermann sees the survival of works of art, especially those uh, I would add, built of stone and marble, as having powers both to adhere and haunt. Because this church is also Innocent's tomb, he is buried in the basement, the haunting goes on to the day of judgment, when Innocent and his Roman martyrs will be reborn 
And that indeed is another story. The church therefore assumes a latency, a patient anticipating of end times, inspiring an awareness and welcoming of the eternal return. Events continue. I'm going to talk about specifically St. Emerentiana here. Get up a little more, a bit more closely. <clears throat> One theorist on narratology has written that, quote, texts are inscribed with the conditions of their tellability, end quotation. I like narratology. It sounds a bit strange when you quote from them, but it all makes sense. In other words, texts and works of art provide us the keys we need to see and read the narrative. <laughs> although the inscriptions are not entirely stable. We might say that works of art give themselves up to interpretation, although not without a fight. Works of art and texts demand viewers and readers. They need interpreters. They are performances in search of an audience. Ercole Ferrata planned and made the majority of this relief, which represents the stoning of St. Emerentiana. He slaved away on this as well as the overlife statue of St. Agnes in the same church and Debussin, flames, and in addition completed Melchiorre Caffa's relief of St. Eustachio among the beasts, dedicating himself to these three projects off and on for a decade, a heroic labor worthy of his namesake. In the end, Ferrat died before finishing his tasks which in fact had set, he had set aside for nearly the last 15 years of his life. I'm um, sorry, the last 15 years of his life because of what must have been a rancorous standoff between him and the Pamphili family. But he had prepared early on several bozzetti, preparatory uh, figures, as you, can, as, as you can see. Well, here, is, here is one of them, um, of the composition of St. Emerentiana, guaranteeing, although it was not his original intention, that his assistant and eventual replacement Leonardo Retti, I'll come back to his name later on, would know his plans for the full arrangement and could finally bring the relief to conclusion, albeit not until the early 18th century. From start to finish, 40 years went by. A narratologist would refer to Emerentiana's story as a fabula, defined by Leon Battista Alberti in his text on painting as myth or fiction, as opposed to historia, or in Latin, historia, which tells of true events. According to Alberti, relief sculpture, a representational system that creates meaning, in other words, shares a great deal with multi-figured paintings and also qualifies for historical representation, which is historia or storytelling. But what was myth for Alberti had been truth for those ancient Greeks who reveled in the stories of Olympian gods, the fateful events of Oedipus, the adventures of Bacchus, Ariadne's love, and, or the Minotaur on the island of Crete, as you just saw there. What we today see as fabulation, most Romans in the 17th century pursued, perceived as the true story of Emerentiana. Although the distinction between historia and fabula was important to Alberti, the work of the narratologist neither begins nor ends, neither fails nor succeeds based upon one's ability to separate fact from fiction. It is all narration and fabulation what Michael Rifater calls the truth in fiction paradox, which of course is no paradox at all. Indeed, the language in Ferrata's contract refers to his relief of St. Emerentiana as qual historia, that history, that history representation, I suppose you could say. We have precious few facts about the life of St. Emerentiana. Johann Kirsch, writing for the Catholic Encyclopedia in the early 20th century, fleshes out the story somewhat by identifying Emerentiana as living from the late 3rd into the early 4th century, a contemporary of St. Agnes. Kirsch refers to the older itineraries on martyrs' graves and how they relate the tradition of Emerentiana being buried in the vicinity of Rome's Via Nomentana near the church and tomb of St. Agnes. So this is Saranese, Fuori le mura, outside of the walls. Her story undoubtedly passed down many generations before the earliest published works detailing her existence suggests that Emerentiana indeed was related to St. Agnes as a foster sister. She's a, a sorella de Latis. They had the same nurse. Benedetto, by the way, there they are, uh, buried together under the altar. Emerentiana's on the left and St. Agnes is on the right. Uh, of the Church of San Agnese, Fuori, or uh, Via Nomentana. 
more about the story. Benedetto Ciniti, writing in the Encyclopedia dei Santi, and also, more importantly, as author of the entry in Emerenti uh, on Emerentiana for the authoritative Bibliotheca Sanctorum, tells us that an unknown author of the fifth century added to the Latin Passio in St. Agnes, written by the pseudo Ambrose, it's all important in medieval, it's very important, that Emerentiana came to Agnes's funeral where, funeral, where she, Agnes, appeared to her family fully eight days after her death. Agnes actually is not in this particular relief. Chiniti reports that, quote, a surprise attack by pagan fanatics dispersed the Christians. Emerentiana, instead of fleeing, courageously challenged the assailants, only to be stoned to death, end quotation. Well, we tell one another stories so that we can understand ourselves individually, collectively, and as beings, and therefore we have a predisposition to read through this relief something human, ripping, tragic on one level, and glorious on another. We eagerly participate in the story, listening with our eyes. Understanding what happens in this fabula requires common sense, which is another way of saying that the logic of action and placement of figures should, and here does, have some homologous relation to the world we occupy. Mika Ball, in her text on narratology, calls this the logic of events. But there is a great deal beyond the logic of events, as we shall see. Quoting from D.H. Lawrence, although in a very different context than he was using, we might say that this sculptural relief, in this sculptural relief we discover, quote, a new world within the known world, end quotation. But that's a phrase from D.H. Lawrence, which I just like. First, some more background on the commission for the sculpture in this niche, along with a few comments about the state of sculpture in mid-17th century Rome. In other words, I am dealing briefly here once again with the extra, what is called, what narratologists call the extra diegetic. As a narratologist, they said, we call it. That which is outside both the telling and the spatio-temporal world of the story, which are obviously important for us, our historians. Ercole Ferrata signed his contract for both this relief and the statue depicting St. Agnes on 23 July 1660. This is the basic facts here. He toiled, for the two he toiled on the two projects for the next decade and a half, but had not finished more than the lower part of the relief by his de death in 1686. After another three years, Leonardo Retti took over and completed the upper half, which you see here, not wrapping things up until 1705. He had as reference Ferrata's Bozzetto, which I showed you earlier, as I've mentioned. Documents in the Pamphili archive suggest that Ferrata, before he abandoned the project, and what was apparently a dispute with Don Camillo Pamphili over payments, had completed in stucco the heavenly figures in the upper part of the relief. But only in stucco, not what we see here. It strikes me that Retti more or less discarded Ferrata's full-scale stucco work and struck out on his own, at least in terms of the handling of figures. A man named Antonio Maglia, this is from the archives in the, the Gregorio Pamphili, where you can find this information, was brought in as an expert appraiser of Retti's relief. He was not in the least taken by the substitution, commenting that Retti's version in comparison with Ferrata's work was dry, secco, di maniera estenuata, with an attenuated, that is, tired or weak style. Too much marble was caught, cut away, leaving an irremediable defect, the defecto irremediabile. I'm going to look at this and see how you know, irremediable the defects really are. There are two authors here working in different modes. One, Ferrata, so now I'm showing you the whole thing, hues close to the so-called classical Baroque style of Alessandro Algarve, the other to a late post-Bernini form of the Baroque, almost Barocchetto, or something that means a little Baroque. In narratological terms, these two hands become, in Mika Ball's language, and she's written on narratology, First of all, narrative agents, but in a more important sense, they bear responsibility for what Ball calls the linguistic subject, by which she means a function rather than a person. It is the voice of the text, decidedly not of the author. In terms of visual narratology, one can think of style and composition with all their subtleties, complicated intimations, and imputations intact as focalizer and as narrator. Perhaps all imagery is polysemous in the sense that one can never exhaust levels, types, and instances of meaning or semiosis. As Roland Barthes once observed, there is always a floating chain of signifieds 
from which we can choose when doing our critical work. And as always, a choice for is a choice against. My sense is, although I cannot see how it would be proven, that Baroque imagery is polysemy squared or cubed. Certainly what is going on in the Church of San Agnese constitutes an immense semantic field. In a fairly deep concave space, one sees St. Amarantiana half kneeling, you can see her there, before the very Baroque-looking tomb of St. Agnes. I have mentioned that Ferrata owed much to his master, Alessandro Algarde, whose marble relief in St. Peter's Basilica of 1646-53, depicting Leo I meaning Attila, Ferrata carefully mined. Uh, Alessandro Algarde on the right, this is about 17 and a half feet tall, the one on the left, this is you know, all marble on the wall, is about 13 and a half, so that's much larger. My language, of course, prejudices the observation because I suggest Ferrata owed something to Algarde, when in fact his references to the nearly contemporary but significantly larger relief constitute an instance of intertextuality rather than simple obligation. Clearly there are quotations from Algarde, Ferrata's father figure. Ferrata displaces and remakes Algarde, which is a filial gesture. We can see this dynamic intertextual relationship between Leo I meeting Attila and the martyrdom of St. Emerentiana in terms of how the two sculptors pushed large groups of figures to the sides, leaving a vertical seishura in the middle of each composition. So right there and right here, right down the middle. And in both the heavenly and earthly realms occupy separate zones or bands. As Attila runs in one direction while turning in the opposite toward the celestial avenging images of Saints Peter and Paul, and you're right, his arms reach out, one in haste, the other to shield his eyes from the terrifying image and to ward off flashing swords descending from the skies above. You see Peter and Paul with their swords up there. Several of the stoning goons, especially those you see here, pushed up against the right side of Ferrata's relief of St. Emerentiana in body Giovanni Paolo Lomazzo's Figure Serpentinata, the serpentine figure, a later Renaissance, early modern conceit in which contraposto, counterpoise, turns into something serpentine or flame-like. As James Elkins characterizes Lomazzo's conception of the serpentine figure, quote, the center is protected and the unprotected margins of the body flail around it, end quotation. Algarve's Atala turns to his left, but swings his head back over his right shoulder, with his hand spontaneously climbing, as we have seen, which is a gesture both of fear and beholding. All the figures in the lower register of Ferrata's relief twist, gesticulate, and swing about. One young man on the lower right looks up while taking aim with, while bending toward the earth to retrieve his ammunition. As a text, he is intertext to Algardi's figure who uh, kneels behind Pope Leo I. Here. Ferrata Saint Emerentiana herself twists in an imaginary wind, her drapery spiraling like flames. <coughs> I've suggested that one turns to Leon Battista Alberti for early modern language in a description of historia, or storytelling. Um, Anthony Grafton, and going back to him again, he writes very well, even though he's just a general historian, he writes about our history extremely well. Anthony Graffin, in his magisterial treatment of Alberti and the concepts of historia and historia, succinctly characterizes what was at stake. So I quote from him, quote, history in the thought of the humans, as well as in that of the ancients, belonged to the art of rhetoric, seen above all as a narrative designed to embody the principles of morality and prudence in the form of well-told stories about great men, history. So humanist after humanist proclaimed, echoing the sentiments of ancient historians and rhetoricians, was magistra vita. It's worked examples of good and evil, effective and ineffective conduct, moved readers more rapidly and more profoundly than statements of general principle could. Which is a great report for explanation of many things that are going on here. What Grafton underlines here is the didactic value of historia, the representation of history. The representation of St. Emerentiana's stony is, among many other things, an exemplum virtutis, an example of virtue, which is a rhetorical figure of great importance, one that turns up in sermons and prayers, for instance. Even before we read the narrative, we are confronted by a paradigm of virtuous behavior. 
Aristotle, in his rhetoric and topics, refers to the enthymeme as a rhetorical figure that instructs or persuades by example. As a rhetorical syllogism, the enthymeme is tricky. We accept its truth without requiring absolute logical proof. Much religious art of the early modern period is at one level or not or another enthymematic. We are so used to seeing religious paintings, statues, and reliefs as exemplars, examples. We hardly pay this rhetorical figure any attention. I think we should. Besides focusing on the story, we recall that there is a spiritual element in the attention we pay to this relief. One accepts the stoning of St. Emerentiana as a visual sermon, one meant to be reproving and improving, one that requires or leads to a devotional response. Next, taking our hint from Alberti, we study the story logic, while keeping in mind Horace's dictum in his Ars Poetica, the need to teach, the need to move, and the need to delight, as rhetoric. The logic of narrative depends upon syntax, the putting together of figures and forms in a coherent manner so as to generate meaning. A sculptor presents heavy marble assemblages that by their very nature express a higher coefficient of reality than painting can ever accomplish. I was expecting painter to say, what? <laughs> no way! I'm, I'm just, I, I go for sculpture. The sculptor's <laughs> figures are quite literally ponderous. He's <laughs> way a lot. They have an almost irresistible ontological presence. They are eloquence on a large scale, and as John Stuart Mill might have said, they are meant to be heard, whereas poetry is meant to be overheard. The image upon our, the, they, excuse me, they impinge upon our existential location, even our personal space. One experiences something almost oppressive, although aesthetically stimulating, when walking from one to the other of the high reliefs and monumental statues in Savagnese. The action of the narrative grows out of this syntagmatic arrangement of figures, by which I mean, first of all, something almost metrical, and I just think this detail seems to have meter to it. The placement of figures can have the visual rhythm that one associates with verse, or declarative language for that matter. We can read from left to right. There are groupings to the left and the left middle, followed by, as I have mentioned, a medial seizure or break which separates the assassins on our right from their victims on our left. A seshura, from the Latin verb cadere, to cut off, interrupts poetic meter, causing a pause. Rudolf Wittkover, in a well-known reading of metrical sequences, which he relates to a fugue, in Boromini's Church of San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane, emphasizes the importance of the visual seshura in Baroque architecture. I'm making a similar claim for a sculptural relief which, of course, is art, which is indeed architectural. Although the art, historian, the art historical term Baroque has often enough been associated with ornament, what the Baroque really signifies is something visually and compositionally constitutive. That is to say, the word Baroque communicates a vivid sense of rhythm, spacing, and sequence. And the term syntagmatic comes from the early days of structuralist criticism, as was seen by Ferdinand de Saussure as a way in which words in a discourse are, according to him, arranged in sequence on the chain of speaking. Combinations supported by linear linearity are syntams, which are always composed of two or more consecutive units. That last part was <coughs> yeah. So Saussure, Saussure's rather abstract way of expressing himself, admittedly, uh, does just the same articulate the lexical order that written and, in the present case, visual language can demonstrate, express, or instantiate. We tend to accept without too much investigation the groupings of figures and the character of gestures in early modern paintings and sculptural reliefs. But the ways in which these visual elements generate meaning can bear some investigation. A syntam is a linguistic element requiring a subject and a verb. Here that would be, say, man for subject and throws for verb. The direct object then would be a stone, and the indirect, indirect object, emerentiana. We see action and read sequence and significance. The result has yet to occur. In other words, Saint Emerentiana half kneels in her prayerful attitude. Several stones, I'm just again showing the stones there, lying beside her on the steeply sloping shelf, but she seems to remain at this moment uninjured. In terms of spatial relationship, we could say that the Syntagmatic is horizontal, 
in parallel fashion, one word ties to the next from left to right, or for that matter in sculpture, it can be from right to left. The associative or paradigmatic is perpendicular. It's a sort of like binary opposition. It's, it's structural, it's really lovely, that sort of thing. Here, perpendicular is metaphorical and semiotic, of course, not visual. The men in the lower zone to the right relate to something outside of themselves, outside the immediate narrative, indeed. Um, taking any of the stone throwers, we can see that paradigmatically, not visually, but narratologically by inference that each is a thug, a pagan, an evildoer. They know not what they do. If, in fact, they do know what they are doing, their relation outside of themselves, paradigmatically, in other words, is pure evil. We sense the malevolence simply by looking at the relief, especially if we know the story that this arrangement of figures represents. Even if we do not know the story, we tend to read from left to right, up and down. In the lapidation of St. Amarantiana, we might read in a more cyclonic motion, beginning left of center with the figure of Amarantiana, then swinging around behind the attackers on the right, and back to the left, leaping over the empty space in the middle. For Saussure, so the binary way of reading models the way humans think and children learn. Everything is relationship, according to Saussure. Sentences and sculptural reliefs are not identical things, of course, but they share certain kinds of supervening logic. Words and images can, as we see here, relate to the same or very similar narratives. Interestingly enough, the focalizer or narrator shifts when we gaze upon the heavenly figures in the upper half of the marble relief. Insofar as style functions here as narrator, we have someone and something new coming on the scene. By that, I do not mean just the younger sculptor, Leonardo Retti, or the heavenly agents. Rather, I intend that the style together with the morphology of figures and syntax of relationships becomes another narrator. This relief has more than one voice. We are, what we art historians might call the hand, which of course is a synecdoche, the taking of a part for the whole, which is the sculptor, in other words, is antecedent to the narrator, whom I have characterized here not as a person, but as the style, one I earlier considered in perfectly traditional and somewhat out-of-date art historical terminology, as barroquetto, the so-called little baroque. What we have with Leonardo Retti's contribution is almost but not quite beyond the late Baroque, edging into the period of what I call buon gusto, or good taste. But that, again, is another story, certainly not the one I am deliberating over here. Insofar as voice or narrator is style, we need to pause and look more, look more closely at some of Retti's figures. But in a second, but I thought I would mention that Giuseppe Mazzuoli, uh, that you see on the right, is his work done in St. John Lateran, Rome. All these, these great figures along the nave. Uh, it's very good. That really is um, a uh, kind of a late Baroque, a Barocchetto style. Whereas it seems to me that um, over there, of Leonardo Retti, not so good. I refer to Retti's figures not to suggest that he, the sculptor, has somehow deposited a particular meaning into them, but that the sculpture itself generates and constructs meaning, which we then read. Or perhaps it is our reading that produces sense and significance. Either way, a kind of harmonic discord between the figures above and those below jolts us. Multiple narrators are indeed signs pointing to the fictionality of any text, literary or visual. Roland Barthes, in his rhetoric of the image, declares that composition, and here he means something very much like what art historians call style, quote, carries an aesthetic signified, in quotation. In other words, style conveys a cultural code that Bach conveniently puts with the category of the aesthetic. I suppose he would say that meaning is not lexical, does not deliver the words or vocabulary of a spoken and written language. One could argue with the distinctions upon which Bach depends, but the basic fact that style impinges itself upon narrative is part and parcel of narrative voice. And we have, as I suggest, at least two identifiable styles what I would call drawing upon fairly traditional language in the discipline of our history, classical Baroque, and a smoothed out early 18th century little Baroque. Again, Baroque actor. Much of the action in the lower register manifests itself in spiraling bodies, gestures, and drapery patterns, as we've seen. These I have related in general to the figura serpentinata, with its mix of stability, tight turning on an axis, and looser, whirling, or drapery, 
or spasmodic forms or gesture, as we see in several of the figures to the far left, the ones who have come to stand before Agnes's tomb that now flee. As Elkins characterizes such bodily, I mentioned it before, Jim Elkins, characterizes such body images, <clears throat> these psychomachiae, they derive from fundamental structures and profiles, pyramids, flames, serpents, and S-shapes. Elkins associates this twisting body language with Quintilian's description, description of an agile orator's gesticulations which result in a kind of curve, what the ancient orator characterizes as, quote, an impression of animation, grace, and charm, and rotation. Ferrata's sculpture maintains its beauty amidst a maelstrom of violence. In the upper section, again, the one we assigned to Reti, the figures, this is especially true of the angel bearing the flowered crown of martyrdom uh, for St. Emerentiana, tend to lose their corporeal reality beneath the violently fluttering patterns of drapery. The voice of this representation seems to howl, to invoke a spirit of the sublime, a voice not unlike Edgar Allan Poe's Norwegian mariner describing his descent into the maelstrom. Here we might say the heavenly realm seems to be the frenzy from which the angel descends, creating what Poe called, quote, the wild, bewildering sense of the novel which confounds the beholder, end quotation. The novel, of course, is the dissonant tone caused by the unusual. One may argue over the effectiveness and aesthetic pleasure derived from such competing voices offered by Ferrata and Retti, but it would be hard to avoid considering the sense of narrative dissonance created by the two sculptors. Dissonance is rhetorical and narratological, a means by which one voice distances itself from a character or from another voice. Here, one sculptor's style contradicts the others, is antithetical to it. I doubt that Retti intended his style to be dissonant, but intentionality is beside the point and traditionally understood in critical discourse to be irrelevant if not fallacious. What then is the narrative point of these writhing heavenly forms pushing the upper section of the relief toward the left boundary? The fairly deep concavity of the plane to which these figures are attached, you can see that at the very top of here, fairly deep concavity. to which the figures attach themselves, seems to hasten the devastating effect as airborne shapes rotate inwards to their right, our left, ostensibly crushing figures and cloud patterns against the unyielding left frame, thereby creating a dramatic terminal seishura. A puto cradles a, a lamb on his lap, and in his hands, his right turning in an impossible curve, you can see there, are what appear to be palm fronds and lilies. A bare-breasted woman, a, a bare-breasted allegorizing woman welcomes Emeritiana into the outskirts of heaven, her right hand beckoning, her left pointing upward. The rivulets of her clothing swirl about her as if in a tempest. Yeah, see there. The angel with the fiery hair, go back to this one here, not as clear as I'd like to be, but I think you can see what I'm talking about. The angel with the fi fiery hair, he who descends in the middle of the composition, with the crown of flowers in his right hand, a large frond in his left, maneuvers with gigantic flapping wings like a vulture's, ones that create vortices of visual turbulence. The heavens, ontologically separated from the violence below, which is earthbound and fictionally related to a certain part of Rome, what is today called, as I mentioned before, the Via Nomentana, seem to clamor for Emerentiana's soul. The narratological effect rims with harshness and dissonance, a kind of rhetorical cacophony. There is a spirit or quality, a consciousness, a consciousness or being in this section of the relief, accompanied by, ironically enough, a sense of dissociation or even intrusiveness in the narration. Insofar as sculptural style here functions as narrator, there is, I would claim, a distancing, even an alienation between parts of the overall narrative. There is conflict in the very being of this work. For one thing, the heavenly creatures display no empathy for Emerentiana's suffering. She, who accepts the role of Christian martyrdom, one who witnesses and testifies through self-sacrifice to the truth, expects no sympathy, of course. But would we not find in a purely human and compassionate level conflict, even alienation? 
Dissonance, of course, is a highly uh, effective narratological strategy, one that obtains between the narrator and the consciousness on the part of the viewer, reader, of what is being narrated. Emma Rentiana takes the road less traveled. She could have fled, but with her faith, she stands her ground. Her martyrdom brings into being the other story world, the one immediately beneath the representation of her stoning. In the half dome of the conch up above, which is separate from the relief, gamboling, plaster putti, flaunt a banderole with a triumphant invitation, veni sponsa Christi. Come, bride of Christ. And so ends the story, but perhaps I should say that we see here where the story ends, because despite its conclusion, the narrative below remains always before our eyes, frozen in a kind of colossal marble amber. In other words, we can take in, we can see the entire narrative at once. The original coup d'oeil, of course, creates an inarticulate impression, or given the sheer size of the image, a collision. We see the beginning, middle, and end all at once, which automatically and simultaneously delivers the rhetorical figures of prolepsis and analepsis, looking forward and backward in time, a flashback and a flash forward. Remigius Bonilla, in an article on diegesis and representation, insists that, quote, the critic must conjecture where and when in the spatio-temporal universe the narrator, the narrator performs the telling, in quotation. Here, the telling began once the relief was put into place and it has been continuous these several hundreds of years. In a slightly different sense, of course, if we shift his reference to a spatio-temporal universe away from the vessel in which the relief exists, Samanesian Agone, Samanesian Gatsabona, and toward the story world in which St. Emerentiana lived, then we slip back into the distant past. A third way of conceptualizing the spatio-temporal universe alerts us to the ways in which the story unfolds before us, calls attention to the style and mode of representation, how the narrative voices of, of the narrative voices, of which, as we've seen, there are at least two related to the work done by Ferrata and Retti, narrate and therefore create the story world before us. But antecedent to court considering the particular instances of sense uh, or sense of an ending with the large marble reliefs balance, balancing, as I suggest, on a nanosecond of our time, the putti play, you see here, in the midst of our lived and breathed <coughs> moments. Just as angels in the occasional cherub in the upper part of the main relief frame the heavenly welcome of Amarantiana's immortal soul, so too do these children in the conch frame the narrative with play and, in all likelihood, feigned innocence. Here we may start thinking of a kind of aleatory aesthetic, one that grows out of the seeming unpredictability of what I refer to as gambling. The lower part of the monumental relief, the one we assign primarily to Farat while withholding from him uh, the narrative voices, I have called it, both represents and follows a logic of events what I refer to as the syntagmatic. Here we are somewhere else, in a ludic realm, but only superficially can we think of play, the ludic, as the opposite of seriousness. Just the same, there can be no question but that the Angelini, these putti, riotously romp about while tossing the magic banderole, a piece of cloth bearing the triumphant message. What I want to understand in relation to these putti and Farata's relief, not to mention the thousands of other spiritelli that climb walls, doze in altars, and flit about Rome's hundreds of churches, what is what Hans Geir Gadamer terms in his Truth and Method, quote, the mode of being of play as such, in quotation. While well, Gadamer concerns himself with the to and fro of play as essential to the nature of aesthetics, my interest lies more specifically with narrative. In other words, I will not follow him too far into his ontological investigation of the work of art, fascinating and important as his philosophical reasoning may be. On the other hand, Gadamer's sense of play in, lang in language, in which there's always a to and fro between reader and text or several people in conversation, leads us to an awareness that there is a back and forth between us as readers of works of art and the object itself. To and fro is indeed for Gadamer the basis of philosophy, which is why he loved Plato's dialogues and all understanding. 
If we were to impute a fictional intentionality to these puti players, we probably would conjecture that they themselves do not think that play is serious. But of course, it is. Play, according to Gadamer, has a sacred seriousness. In terms of the narrative, what do these puti know? Putting the word in scare quotes, no. Gadamer responds that, quote, the player knows very well what play is and that what he is doing is only a game, but he does not know what exactly he knows in knowing that. The implication is beautiful saying. It takes a while to figure it out. The puti holding the banderole certainly do not read it, nor do they give any indication of knowing what was happening down below. The other puti scatter about like children in a play group, chatting, pretending to read, or simply lolling on cumulus clouds. The banderole twists about it as if it too responds more to localized atmospheric conditions <coughs> and to than to laws of gravity. Its elegant swallow tip of being sealed here. They're beautifully done. Here's one, there's one on the side, two. Uh, at either end, fluttering. The Puti's narrative has no beginning, middle, or end. Their playing is just going on. It just happens. And yet we know something of which they show no real awareness. A bride, a price, <coughs> has been beckoned by God. The conch sails far from the ground, lessening its visibility, fading away in, as you can see here, in grayish plaster and clay, which is dun colored, dull of surface. So we tear our eyes from this endless conclusion and go about our tour of San Agnese in Piazza Navona because we are not sitting and reading a book, but are standing and walking. We are different kinds of readers than narratologists usually assume or describe. We, perambulating readers, experience kinesthesia and have a gut level sense of esthesis. Literary criti critics take reader response theory into consideration. Imagine what viewer response theory can be. We are not sitting still with the text in front of us, nor are we in a theater watching a movie or seeing a play. We are moving about, not in a museum per se, although Savignese has been described as a museum of late Baroque sculpture, painting, and architecture, but in a sacred space brimming with voices, storytelling, and meaning. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>
No, no, there's, 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 yeah, words are not images, uh, you know, yes. exactly. However, there is, there's this, there is a sense of narrative that is going on, and what they said, what the structures said about narratology, and what, and nowadays it's still very, uh, it, it's, it's still being practiced. A lot of my Germans, interesting, what I mentioned to me as a name. But uh, also, by a, a fair number of people in English departments in the United States are still talking about narratology, and it hasn't caught on in art history. Mika Ball has written a book called Narratology. It's in its third edition now. And she wrote in the third edition saying, I'm leaving out everything that I had in the first and second edition for art historians. Because although I believe narratology works for art history, I can't seem to convince anyone else. <laughs> she convinced me, though. <laughs> but I might be among, among the relatively few. I think it does work. I think this. Again, we're doing, we're, I'm, I'm working metaphorically, I'm not working literally with this sort of thing. So clearly, words and images uh, are, are, in no philosophical sense can you say that they operate in exactly the same way. But there are similarities, there are comparisons, and there are, as I said, there are both, there are uh, rhetorical and, uh, um, uh, rhetorical associations be between the two. I, I don't know, I find, I find when I, I find that these the language works, even if it's covering different media. So I'm aware of the I'm aware of the danger though. It is a danger, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's my question now. Uh, the top left of the hierarchy. Yeah. The figure which is difficult to understand who she is, talking about. Yes. Now, you may remember and I don't remember. The four Fandentes are the four cardinal virtues. Mm -hmm. Is Prudus above her? I don't remember. That would be interesting to be, I mean, it's, it is something, um, <coughs> again, this is, your, this is something that I've been, I've been I'm, uh, uh, I have to, um, I want to do those paintings, uh, and I want to do, even the paintings in the ceiling, which are, are flawed in many ways, but I want to get that in there too. And of course, show the ways in which the architecture itself is, is integrated with all of these stories. And uh, again, there are five martyrs, and I'm, I've gotten through two so far in my writing. Uh, but that's a point that you bring up. It's very helpful to me. Thank you. I will certainly keep that in mind. This, this, this could be this allegorical significance, and I love allegory. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember which one is which. If this is above her, would be, you know, there any correspondences yeah. to everybody else? Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Absolutely.
And then I just saw all this Baroque sculpture. I, I, I can't explain it, except that it just, it bowled me over. It, 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 it made me weaken my knees. It, I, I saw something. I just couldn't put words to it at, at that point. Now, obviously, so I'm still, you know, at the end of my career, I'm still trying to find words for this sort of experience. This stuff is powerful. And the architecture was part of it as well. But I was seeing the sculpture in relief. And it is huge stuff. And it's beautiful. That's the other thing. This is very well done. I mean, there's some bad sculpture in Rome in the 17th and 18th century, especially the 18th century. Unfortunately, I love the 18th century. Some of the sculptures and so on. This stuff is good. Renti is not so good. Parat is terrific. That's why I can't just say, oh, it's bad sculpture. Let's go move on. That's not good enough. Um, this stuff is really good. I knew that intuitively. I didn't, I mean, don't ask me to describe good sculpture, but I think most of us probably recognize it when we see it. Uh, this is powerful. Yes. Just to continue with this theme, and thank you so much, uh, uh, who do we give credit to for the iconographical program, and how much do we know about that? Are there words? Are there drawings? Are there? Yeah, there's the, um, I'm trying to think how big the archive is. Uh, in, the, in, in the Palazzo Pampili, there's an archive. Oh my goodness, this, this, is, this is, their archive, it looks like a train station. It's mm -hmm. so huge. The things they have in there. And there are descriptions of it. Uh, it nobody's put quite all together yet. There's been relative, there's been, for our history, not a lot has been There's been things, good things written about this. Uh, but there, uh, this is something that has to, that, that, that I, you know, yes, in short, to answer your question. But, but and, and so, <laughs> is, is, is it the Pat Felix that write the iconographic program, do you think? Or is it they have some uh, uh, advisor or? I don't know. I think Don Olympia, maybe. I mean, she was a great Don Olympia. I think she was in on some of that as well. It's not going to be clear in the archive okay. precisely who wrote it. Uh, but there were any number of people on the payroll, huge numbers of people on the payroll, and they weren't all making sculpture. They were planning things, too. Okay. Um, there was a particular cardinal whose name escapes me, who seemed to be very much part of this and made a lot of decisions of, uh, and got kind of angry when too much drapery got pushed outside of one of the niches. Um, I can't remember his name. This uh, is, again, the same period. And so there are a lot of people in there contesting uh, about this. And then people come in and do evaluations about how this person should be paid and so on. Okay. But I think there is a central voice behind it all. And I think it has to, I think uh, it comes from Mr. Tennant, mm -hmm. probably, in general. At least. And, and, and that's and a good question. Are there families who paid for these side shrines or these altars? Yeah. Or is it just all Pantheli money? All Pantheli. Okay. Not until, as I said, the 1990s did they turn the church back over to the Vicariato, or whatever they call it these days. But uh, <clears throat> after one of the last weddings of the Pamphili, uh, they decided to give it back to the church. But is this, it's unheard of uh, to have this kind of you know, family church. Family chapel, yes, family church. Uh, almost pal It's called a Palatine chapel, so it's a Palatine church. I, I don't, I've, I've asked other art historians if they know anything more about this. They can't come up with any, in, in, certainly Rome or in, or even in Italy, I don't think, to be able to do that. Anyway. Right. Yeah, no, in my ignorance, uh, what I missed was um, your oral structure of relationships between, yeah. between the iconographical program, which makes me wonder whether, you know, when you project yourself as a project, the creation of the project, how much will remain? Yeah, yeah, laying yeah. out the structure. Yeah, yeah, you see yeah. what I mean? What, what, yeah. what is the weakness in that? In, the, in, the, in this mound of narrative. Where is the weakness? Yes. I mean, is there one? Is, is it a totally, is it genuine from architectural? No, 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 no. Is it flawed right? in some ways? Sure, sure. No, what I'm going to say is that it's, it's one of the niches. Well, that, you know, that, that's, that's a difficult question. Yeah. No, but back, and it was, I was carrying it back to the architecture. Back to the architecture, yeah. From, it, from inception, did it have the iconographical program? Oh, yeah, I mean, there's no question from inception, the iconographical program was there. It's in the very early documents that it was um, <clears throat> um, and, and I'm looking back upon it. I'm not trying to find what they intended. Again, I'm against the intentional fallacy. 
I don't know exactly what they intended, but if I can, if I can infer from what I see, uh, if, uh, if I sense that these things work together. Now, there are some failures, as I said, like the paintings at the very top of the ceiling have some problems to them, and that, they, that comment was made back, way back when, just as with, um, you know, uh, Farata's, uh, after he died, the, the upper part wasn't really executed uh, by Retti very well. There are some, there's some failures even in that sense, uh, in, in terms of quality, which has to disrupt, <coughs> in some ways, the allegory and or narratology that is going on. I don't know. I don't. It's a swarm. It's an unreadable swarm of, of people up there. Yeah. I actually, I kind of like it, but I think, I think most people seem to think that it, it doesn't, it doesn't succeed particularly well. They thought that in the 70s, and things like that. But that's okay. These are human-made things. They're not. Most of it is good, and the architecture uh, again is. I have to get to a whole other metal that find rhetorical terminology for the architecture that's going to make it work with the, and I've got ideas, and I've already written some, a number of things about this too, um, to make it all make it all work out. I want just to you know, satisfy my curiosity. But with your question, it's important to note that the Roman may not be planned as square. Yeah. Yeah. Go to Rome. When you go to Rome, I know a number of you are there. Go to that church. Um, I'm trying to think the best time to go. If you could ever, if it's ever open in the evening for a concert, which there very, are very often or free, uh, very frequently there are concerts there, and go in when the lights turn, because for some reason they've done a good job of lighting the place at night. And it's, it's, it's magical. And the whole thing comes back to this is such good art. <laughs> that I think you will find that it shakes you a little.